Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe, and our guest today is Eric Stowe, who is the CEO and founder of Splash. I'm a Forbes contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing, and Eric is a social entrepreneur of the highest order. And we're excited to have you on the show, Eric. Thank you for joining us. Very kind. Thank you, Devin. Eric, you've been doing some amazing things around the world in bringing water to people who lack it. But your strategy is a little different than uh, some organizations that uh, focus on water, where you are focusing on people in urban areas who lack clean water, which uh, it's hard for some of us to understand how that could even happen. Tell us a little bit about how you got started. Where did this come from? Uh, sure. Um, great question. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to work in uh, many orphanages in many countries uh, for many years. Uh, and during that time, there was this, this great juxtaposition. On one end, you'd have this institution serving abandoned kids. Um, and invariably, almost always, they didn't have potable water, no access to or no way to actually filter it. And yet in the same community, sometimes in the same neighborhood, and even uh, other times on the same block, you would have a restaurant, a hotel, a coffee shop that was providing potable water for paying customers. So really um, trying to marry those two worlds and figure out how you could have this end of the spectrum and this one uh, within the same community. So I spent a lot of time in those early years trying to figure out how you could leverage um, what multinationals, what food service industries, what hospitality industries have done uh, for customers willing to pay a premium cost and actually leverage or repurpose those uh, supply chains, those distribution networks, those service networks, et cetera, and repurpose them for poor populations, uh, most specifically targeting kids. Well, it's extremely interesting work. So give us a, a hard example, if you could. Uh, pick any school or orphanage you want and tell us exactly what you did in order to solve the water access problem. Sure. Um, I'll use the aggregate whole of China, but I think um, within there, there's a ton of illustrations that are all um, uh, similar. So right now, our goal in China is to ensure safe water for every orphanage in the country. It's a, it's a big and it's an expansive project. There's 1,300 orphanages spanning 1,250 cities. Uh, right now, we're in 900 of them. So we're, we're fast approaching the finish line, which is really exciting. But in each one of those, the programmatic um, intervention, methodology, modality, all that stuff, it's, it's pretty similar. So what we do is we, we have tapped into uh, the supply chains that McDonald's has helped create in China. We tapped into the supply chains, the assembly network, the manufacturing, the distribution service, all that stuff so that we ultimately draft in the wake of a multinational. And so we're able to leverage what they've created and apply that in an orphanage context. And what that looks like is when you go into an orphanage, you would go uh, into the main kitchen. A lot of kids in Chinese orphanages are considered special needs. So that's either mental or, phys mental or physical handicap. Um, so they don't have direct access to the filter itself. But we are basically installing in the back end kitchen of, an, kitchen of an orphanage what you would find in the back end of a Starbucks, of a Subway, of a KFC, of a McDonald's in China. But we're doing that in, in an institutional setting serving kids. And basically, caregivers ensure that every baby bottle, all the food is prepared with, uh, and the kids have access to safe water day in, day out. So the water, the clean water, isn't being delivered to the uh, orphanage typically. It's being prepared. It's, the water is being cleaned on site. Is that, is that the... Yeah, yeah. And I think that's... About this? Yeah, your early distinction about um, us being a little atraditional because we focus in urban settings, that's right to the point that there's not a real quantity issue, it's a quality issue. So what we're ensuring is that point of use, at the point that caregivers access or kids access that water, uh, that it is safe to consume. That's great. Now, the you've been working in a number of countries around the world, but one of those is Nepal. Tell us a little bit about your experiences in Nepal before and after the earthquake. Yeah, um, what, a, what a dynamic year it's been, right? I mean, uh, pretty, pretty seismic, um, no pun intended, sorry, that was terrible. Uh, pretty significant shift um, in, our, in our programs, our approach, uh, our staffing, everything. 
So prior to the earthquake, uh, prior to April, our goal uh, was to ensure safe water coverage, uh, and that includes water sanitation and hygiene, for every government school in Kathmandu. It's 650 schools serving nearly 200,000 kids. Uh, right now, we're in 30% of those schools serving 70% of the student population because we went with the, uh, the, the more dense, densely populated schools first. And so we, we looked to be on trajectory to get to 50% coverage, hopefully by the end of next year and so on and so forth, so that we would reach 100% coverage by 2019. And keep in mind, this is entirely locally staffed. We have more staff in Nepal than we do at headquarters. Um, that's certainly part of the core mantra of Splash. That this is this, um, this local infusion. You know, there's this core programmatic mentality and methodology, this proven methodology, uh, but it's, it's nuanced um, and it's tailor-made for the relative geography in which you work. And, and in this case, in Kathmandu, we really needed to look at business creation, market polishing, supply chain management, all this stuff so that we needed to hire local content experts. So it's an incredible staff, uh, incredible office, um, hugely proactive, very responsive, uh, and really an inspiration to the NGO community in Nepal. And so April 25th hits, and this math massive earthquake, um, which is, it's an earthquake, yes, but it's so fortunate it happened on a Saturday, right? It happened during lunch hour on a Saturday, the one day when kids were not in school, because many of the schools that we currently work with, we're in 170 right now, uh, many of the schools we work with outright collapsed. So, um, yeah, our model, our model shifts, uh, but what's interesting is that we've been working with the Department of Education, we've been working with the Ministry of Education, we've been working with the schools, uh, the administration, the headmasters, the teacher, parent-teacher associations, communities, all this stuff, so that after the earthquake, um, schools became kind of one of the only places in Kathmandu where you had uh, available real estate for people to congregate, right? So densely packed, there's very few spaces with open land where people congregate in a safe place. So people started flooding into schools, but one of the great things about the uh, ecosystem we had set up is that they were also able to leverage that safe water. So what we saw uh, in the weeks, days and weeks after the earthquake is a lot of people living on the grounds of the schools um, and using our water for larger community distribution. So our model has shifted a little in that um, the schools that were lightly damaged um, have seen a, a huge influx of students from the schools that were heavily damaged. So we're having to uh, augment or buffer some of the water volume. We're having to add additional uh, water stations and water treatment systems to ensure that we can cover the volume of students, all this stuff. Um, but in a positive frame, it looks like we're going to be back on track before end of year, which is really, I mean, it's significant, and it tells a lot about Nepal in general. Um, it was a catastrophic quake, for sure, in a resource-poor country. Um, but I'd worked in Sri Lanka uh, post-tsunami in 2005. I'd worked in China post-earthquake 2008. We had done um, audits in Haiti to see if our model was applicable post-earthquake. And in none of those have we seen such a quick turnaround uh, on the community side, on the infrastructural side, et cetera, as we have in Nepal. It was just there two weeks ago, and it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing how much has been done in such a short amount of time. So uh, our projects look to be back on track. Uh, in the wake of the earthquake, um, we have been solicited by uh, the Department of Education, which oversees all schools in Kathmandu, to be the leading water sanitation hygiene partner for the schools there. Uh, and then we've had a lot of outside solicitations for consult from pretty big groups um, to be able to provide our services to them um, post-earthquake. So it's, it's, it's just a fascinating time. That's great. This is really, really great stuff, exciting stuff. Let's talk a little bit about um, the you personally, if we can. You are clearly having some great success great success in, in what you're doing and I, you become in that in a sense right a role model to the people that you serve and to others the people in your organization to people who support you and back you uh, everyone who, who's given you money I'm sure thinks of you as a as a role model who do you look up to as a role model um, who do I admire uh, who inspires me um, there's this guy, uh, Ned Breslin. Um, he worked uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, South Africa for 20 plus years. 
um, doing water programming. So working with um, you know, pretty desperate communities uh, to ensure first-time water access and really did some, some pretty amazing work on the ground. <clears throat> he moved back to the US, I think it was like 2005, something like that, and became the international program director for a group called Water for People. A pretty small water organization at the time, a million dollar budget, uh, you know, traditional water projects uh, well in a community, move on well in a community in this, this continual expansion. Um, he became the CEO, I think it was 2011, and took that organization, I mean, really radicalized the organization. Um, wholesale provoked governments that they were working with to really own these projects. Um, really incentivized some of the larger organizations like UNICEF and World Bank to adopt some other models. Uh, and came up with this core concept called Everyone Forever. And, and it's twofold. One is, how do you take uh, a city, then a district, then a state, then a nation, and ensure that every household, every hospital, and every school has safe water uh, and functional toilet coverage? Um, and then how do the, the governments own them for the long term, hence the forever? And he's, he's seeing all this international acclaim, this I mean, incredible social capital. He's speaking all over the place, huge reputation. And in this, uh, this year, this fall in April, he left Water for People as a CEO of an international development organization and joined a domestic facing organization called Wounded Warrior Project. Um, their goal is to help servicemen and women who have been traumatized or disenfranchised by war reintegrate into the larger US society and have continual safety nets to do that. And what he's done is he's taken this everyone forever concept, again, born in an international development, global public health space, uh, focused on water and sanitation, and he's applying it in a domestic facing organization's um, framework. And it's, it's, it's just phenomenal, it's totally inspiring. Um, he's not the CEO, he's a director level staff, he reports to other people. He's not traveling internationally anymore, he's not focused on that aspect, but he saw this as a moment to take something um, cross-functional, cross-sectoral, and cross-pollinate into a different organization and hopefully see optimized results. And that's, that's incredible, incredible. Uh, so hugely admire um, that ability to shift and pivot and say, I think I could take these learnings into a new application and actually see better results. So, no, that's that's a, a great, great story. Yeah. Now, you, you uh, have, uh, are clearly having great success here. Uh, you have been doing some amazing things, and yet I, I, I can't help but think that if you were to apply your skill set in another venue, you might uh, make more money, you might uh, have more fun. Uh, why do you do what you do? I don't, yeah, I mean, the, the money piece is, is aside. I don't know about more fun, though. Um, I mean, the work that we do, it is, it's, it's in a dark place, you know, we're working for kids who have been completely marginalized, right? We work in orphanages and schools and shelters and hospitals and some of the poorest communities globally. It's a really dark and desperate arena, but um, we continue to focus on, believe and see in the positivity, the potential, um, the goofiness, the play of, of these kids. And it's, you know, I'm a dad of two, a six and a 10 year old. And that is, it is a driver, man. It, it, is, a, it is absolute fire in the belly. Um, we, we think of ourselves as a social justice organization. We don't shy away from it. We believe in equity. We believe in parity. We believe that every kid that we serve is just as important, just as goofy, just as naughty uh, as our own kids. And um, it's, it's a lot of fire around that. So uh, I can't imagine having more fun in a different industry or sector, but. Oh, that's great. It is important for us to think about uh, others as being more same, more similar, more like us than, than other, than different. Yeah, fundamental. I appreciate that insight. Now, one last thing, again, coming back to your success, your, your impact, uh, everyone who's watching this is coming from a different perspective. Uh, with different goals and objectives, but we all want to have more impact. We want to do more good in the world. Can you give us something that you do every day that, that perhaps we could emulate yeah. uh, that would allow us to do more good? Um, 
we do something here called an autopsy without blame. And while it's isolated in its application, I think contextually it speaks a lot about the organizational ethos. Um, so the thinking there is that in moments of um, crisis or challenge, I like challenge better, in mo moments of challenge, small or big, <clears throat> we pause as an organization to reflect, to analyze, to dissect, to synthesize, and then figure out the best way forward from that. And that's that should be common business practice no matter where you're at. But I think at an NGO, when you become a certain size and when you um, have this flywheel effect, it's really hard to slow down. It's terribly difficult to slow down. And so we've tried to ensure that we can retain some of the agility and the nimbleness that we've had in our early years uh, as we do get uh, larger as an organization, as our footprint continues to grow. So um, when something happens, again, big or small, um, we really stop as a team to pause and look at it and figure out as dispassionately as possible how we can ensure we never replicate that mistake again. Sometimes that means we can continue bulldozing forward. Oftentimes it means we have to pivot uh, and infrequently it means we have to entirely course correct. But the, the key there is that we don't have a roadmap for this work, right? This is international development, one. Two, it's working in urban landscapes, which is ever shifting. And three, it's focusing on kids, really poor kids and really poor communities. There's no clear roadmap that has been like concretized that we can follow. And so when we do make a mistake, we've got to own up to it. We've got to drop the the hubris and get rid of the ego and just say there's a better idea there's a better way forward we need to as an organization reflect and make sure we are not recreating the same mistakes as we grow um, again it should not be uh, an exception or significant um, but I think culturally organizationally programmatically um, operationally it's really tough to get into that sprint and get ready for that marathon and then have to draw down and say okay we're not doing it correctly and that's based on seeing our impact measurements. When we're off, we need to do it differently. We cannot continue to, to recreate the same thing ad nauseum and hope for new results. So we do a lot of reflection and a, a lot of uh, analysis, and we call that the autopsy without blame. Now, I think that's a great, a powerful uh, example of something you do that enables impact. That, and, and certainly it's not something we've heard from other people we've talked to in the past. That's a really valuable insight. I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, we, we nurture mistakes. We just, we don't repeat them. Yeah, that's great. Now, uh, before you go, I want to ask one last question. You said uh, in our uh, preparation, you, you said that you wanted to put uh, Splash out of business by 2030. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I guess um, the quickest way into it is that as an organization, we see philanthropy to be incredibly mercurial, right? It's transient. Um, ensuring an organizational's uh, stability or sustainability through a couple key funders or a, a couple key funding initiatives, it, it's transient, it's time bound. Um, we also believe that local success can only happen if there's local ownership. So we believe pretty strongly that you can leverage philanthropy, um, you can invest philanthropy wisely to actually create the conditions for local success. Uh, that any organization who is around 20, 30 plus years in a particular community, um, it's counterintuitive, right? We all have this, this mantra about we envision one day when our services are no longer needed. And I would, I would challenge you and others to count on your hand, one hand, how many organizations you can claim and, and show have actually effectively done that who have built up a uh, proof point, the concept, the ecology and ecosystem, so that it can actually sustain their departure and it's intended to sustain their departure. That's, it's incredibly complex and it's far more difficult than water. Water is super easy. There's no intervention, rural or urban, that's all that difficult. Making sure communities continue to drink that water for the long term is damn hard. Uh, and if it's entirely reliant on the international NGO for that sustainability, it's gonna fall apart. And, yeah. and it, I would argue any organization that continues the expansion of that footprint, this replication of a model that, that communities are wholly dependent on you for the long term, it should be outright heresy. Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. Listen, be, before you go, tell us how people can learn more, connect with you, uh, engage, give you money, whatever they want to do. Uh, www.splash.org, eric at splash.org, or give me a call. 
Okay. <laughs> Eric, fine. thank you very much for joining us. Awesome. We, Thanks, Devin. I appreciate the time. Wish you every success in your future work. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Let, let's do some good. I love it.